Good evening and welcome to the Union Report where we review the news week through the lens of industrial disputes with union leaders, commentators and politicians. Joining me tonight to discuss events is the strategic industry leader of the Service Food Workers Union, Jill Ovens, and from Actors Equity broadcaster and actor Peter Elliott. Welcome to you both. Coming up tonight, issue one, does consultation with government mean actual consultation or the pretense of consultation? And are employers using the same tactics when negotiating? Issue two, what impact does a lack of job stability have on workers and society? And issue three, 600 job losses last week doesn't bode well for the unemployment rate. We can afford corporate welfare. Why not more job creation support? Plus, we'll wrap with a final thought. But let's start the show with issue one. We've seen a raft of consultations of late charter schools, school closures in Christchurch, national standards, water rights, and the ports of Auckland. But in each case, the pre-decided position makes the consultation a pretense. Jill, should good faith bargaining require a focus on the outcome as well as the process? Absolutely. I, I can't believe some of the consultation that's going on now. Mm. For example, in the health sector, the government has set up an agency, or actually a separate company called Health Benefits Limited, which has all these financial analysts on it, who are going through and analysing where they can cut $7 billion out of the hospital's budget. We are consulted about that. They mm. come along and they give us presentations, but they don't actually give us the data that they've found out. And every time I ask them and say, why don't you actually go and talk to the workers, the people mm. who work in the kitchens and the laundries to find out what their processes are and how they think, because they have lots of good ideas on yeah. how efficiencies could be gained. Sure. No, they don't want to do that. They have expert groups, as if the people who actually produce the food and wash the laundry are not experts at doing that. Do they think the workers are just idiots? I mean, is that their position? I think so. Not high enough level for right. them. But what I want to do is get workers into these high level discussions so that they could say, that's a stupid idea. That right. would never work. Do you think employers are bargaining in good faith? I mean, have you seen less willingness for them to negotiate of late? Well, it does look like this issue with the ports of Auckland, that they were just mm. biding out their time for mm. September the 30th, mm. when we were one year past mm. expiry of the agreement, and everyone would go on individual agreements. Yeah. So it, it does appear that um, good faith is, is on the surface in some cases. What impact does that have on the rest of the negotiation? I mean, if you've got employers who aren't actually uh, have any intention of, of negotiating in good faith, and it's just a process they're going through, how much more difficult does that make your job when you're trying to sit down and come to an arrangement? Very difficult. But I have to say that in our industries, mm. we haven't found that to be the case. Yeah. Um, our biggest issue is, is probably Australian companies coming over to New Zealand and refusing to give us the same terms and conditions that they will right. willingly give people doing the same job in Australia. For and that's it. because they perceive the, the unions here much weaker than in Australia? Um, yes, but I think they look on us a bit like we're the Mexico to the United States. Right, you know, right. we've got a low-paid workforce yep. that can be exploited. And, yeah. and um, yeah, I think that it would be great if an Australian company had to pay the same wages and give the same penal rates and conditions that the Australian workers get. Peter, as citizens, we expect to be consulted on important issues. And as workers, we expect our interests to be considered in negotiations. Do you think... The recession has created a perception that you're lucky to have a job, so take it or leave it. I, th I think, I think largely at the moment that seems to be across the board. I mean, you you have to be grateful for what you're given. That said, the the negotiations that we're currently working on for with Sparta as, mm. as equity are actually working out quite well. So I'm loath to put you know a stick in amongst sure, the, uh, sure, uh, sure. Among, amongst the pigeons. But uh, you're talking about consultation before, and that's an interesting process because. There are a number of people involved with what we do, and I've got a little email that I probably shouldn't share with you. Yeah, I'm yeah, going please to, but do, it was, but it was an interesting thing. It came in a, a few days ago, and it said that what we are looking for is a thing called the pre-casting brief, and that basically gives us a series of, of issues that we need to clarify before an actor is tied on for a job and, okay. and so forth. And so we were supposedly called in for consultation on this, and the actors' agents and agency TVC producers and the CAANZ, or the Communica uh, Communication Agencies Association, agreed that they would build this new precasting brief. The uh, negotiations were ongoing. They had invited Equity and the ANZA, which right. is the Association of New Zealand Advertisers, 
And they, but the ANZA decided that they needed to put the hot talks on hold because it was all about where you fitted with social media. Uh -huh. And they decided they put those hot talks on hold until September the 13th. So then we heard through the grapevine that basically they made the decision without us, left us out of the loop entirely. And I can't read all the email sure, that was sure, here, sure, but basically sure, sure. it says at the end of this email, it says, although the way they excluded equity from the final negotiation was very wrong and shady, there isn't any way that TVC producers, actors, agents, and the CAANZ are going to change this document. So it doesn't. So, so in spite of us being invited to the table, yeah. asked asked for our opinion and so forth, uh, at the end of the day, when it didn't suit them, they just went ahead and said, "Oh look, forget it, lock, stock, and barrel, you're out of the loop." Looking at the, the the wider issue with the government, do you think the consulta consultation process is legitimate in Christchurch? Because we've lost the environment, Canterbury, uh, the Quake rebuild, there are all sorts of issues there, and school closures are looking nothing like consultation. Do you think the people of Christchurch are getting a bit of a raw deal at the moment when it comes to consultation? I do think the people of Christchurch are getting a raw deal, but I. I I also look at how a government might run those things. Mm, mm. And the difficulty is that they are dealing with a global financial crisis, a meltdown. They're dealing with uh, financial institutions across the, across the globe that are falling down. Mm. They're dealing with uh, the biggest accident that ever befell a town yep. uh, in our country. And it's an enormous cost. Now, that said, I think they're probably trying to deal with an awful lot of things at one time. Are they dealing as well as they should be? No, I don't believe they are. Right. Uh, I don't believe that the, the process is as open as it could be. I think the problem with this government is that they are expediters and they have to be seen as expediters and they tend to do things on a large scale. Unions, unions bad, business good yeah. sort of feel. Yeah. And it's that sort of brush that moves forward. And the, the, the minutiae gets rolled over and crushed along the way. I don't believe they're necessarily evil or bad. No. I just believe that it, uh, they're, they're trying to do the best they can without perhaps dealing with the minutiae they should. Yep. And the fact that yeah, the minutiae turn out to be people, basically. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, uh, and at the end of the day, that's, that's where the care and concern should be. And I think they could certainly take a little more interest in that field. Jill, what do we lose as workers when there is no good faith bargaining from employers? What do we actually lose? Well, over the years that we've had good faith bargaining, People have taken a more, we hate the word partnership, but mm -hmm. a partnership approach yep. where um, we look at problems and we try to solve them together. Mm. And that's proven to be a very productive way to deal with things. So if we get into a situation where it's perceived or where there is no good faith, mm. what you end up with is, is being backed into the corner. And right. then there's only one way to deal with it, and that's to come out fighting. Is that the way that we really want to resolve issues? Mm. And it seems that while employers may win in screwing down labour costs, the actual productivity gains mm. are going to be far less if workers don't feel like they're actually included in the process, that's right? That's right. It's about being respected for what they're doing. Yeah. yeah. Big point. Yeah. Uh, respect is an amazing thing, and that's one of the things that we've got is at Equity. It's one of the problems that we've had is that for many years, e Equity was a very small unif yep. union. It was yep. part of the National Food, Food Workers that's Union right, and Distribution right. Union, yep. National Distribution Union. We were an adjunct to that, and it's only recently that we've managed, managed to get strong enough. And so, respect is what we've been gaming, aiming for. And now mm. we have 500 members, so of uh, of about I think 800 registered in the entire country. So we've reached good. reached a point yeah, where yeah. there is a, a critical mass, mm. and so finally there is a, there is a possibility of consultation. But with that respect, without understanding what it is that we do for that industry, sure. um, then we have no voice and they're not interested in, in, in giving us a voice. And that, that respect thing, I think, is incredibly important. Peter, what do we lose as communities when there is no good faith bargaining from the government? I mean, at the moment, Māori oh. are absolutely beside themselves over this, over this five-week consultation process that's not really a consultation process. Well, you become desperate. If, if, the, if the person who's overseeing you can't hear you, won't look at you, can't, and, and, and is not interested in you, you, can, you, rely, you have to rely on more and more extreme measures to get their attention. Right, right. And that's, that, that to me seems to be the problem. I mean, and, and, and let's face it, as workers, the only tool, the only weapon that we have is one word, and it's comprised of two letters, thank you Winston Peters, and it's N-O, mm. I will not work. Yeah. That is the only, only thing that you've got in your favour. There mm. is nothing else. Mm. And so if that doesn't work, uh, I don't know. But there are extreme measures, and I hope that we don't come to them. But the thing is, you have to start listening. If, there is, if the consultation doesn't work, people will become more and more extreme until, you, until they get a voice. Final question to both of, of you on this. The government's proposed industrial relations uh, law will see employers able to leave the process mm without concluding negotiations. What will that impact on the unions? Oh, what kind of impact? That'll just mean that they delay it until, you know, 
the, the walk out the door. Yeah. I mean, basically, that's what they'll do. So they'll, the, you'll get a take it or leave it approach from, mm. from bosses now? Well, we'll just, we'll just leave the, the, the negotiating process altogether without concluding it. Because it means that the status quo, that it stands, yep. stays, and it means they don't have to change a thing. Mm. Sure. So, I mean, it is a, it's a very beautiful out. Yep. That side of, of negotiations at the moment frightens me when I see mm. what's happening in this country. The level of, uh, we put this rule in, but I would never use it. Right. Uh, and, and you go, and it comes down to personal choice. We have, a, we, for many years, and in, in we had what we call was a sinking lid on things. Yep. Uh, we, uh, we, had, we run a thing called a pink book, which was yep. uh, a set of guidelines. Nobody would ever agree to it. Uh, but it was a set of guidelines under which actors and so forth were uh, um, employed. And it, what happened was that we set absolute minimum rates. Well, they became the rates at which you were paid, not minimum rates. So they kept lowering and sinking. Right. And that's what I think is starting to happen here, is that if they can walk away from the table, not consult anybody, then those rates stay down. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a manner of oppression, I think. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, panel. Moving on with issue two, Roy Morgan last month put the number of New Zealanders underemployed and unemployed at a staggering 19%. For the first time in modern political history, New Zealanders are increasingly look looking at unstable work hours and temporary jobs. What impact will that create for us? Peter, in one year, <laughs> more than 17,600 people aged between 20 and 29 moved to Australia. Wow. We're seeing the social impact of these changes now, aren't we? We are. And what's more, we're losing our trades. We're not losing the brain drain. We're not losing... What we're losing are people who can actually physically get up and make a country tick. Mm -hmm. And the brains behind that and the, and the methods behind that are leaving going offshore. And, and that, that frightens me. You mentioned 17% mm. of, of the people. 19%. Oh, 19%, 19 percent, yep. unemployed. Uh, try being an actor. It's 95% yeah. of actors are unemployed at any one time. Right. And an actor spends most of his life, 90% of his life unemployed and trying to keep uh, ahead of the game yeah. and yeah. finding a way to do that. Uh, so that's uh, it's an interesting process and a lot of actors have gone to Australia and have done extraordinarily well because sure. they started to be respected in, in all, those, all those fields over there. Um, actors uh, into America as well, who do take our talents yeah. that should be respected here and aren't and have to ship them elsewhere, elsewhere. Same thing. What do we need to do to keep actors in New Zealand? I mean, is, is it just a case of we need a, be a better oh, public broadcaster? Oh, okay, yeah, if I were to go down that road. On TV? <laughs> what are we going to see? Well, what we have to do, I mean, the immigration law changed. And when, when the Warners Brothers or the Hobbit That's fiasco right. started, they, they brought in what was colloquially known as the Warners Agreement, mm. which basically means that they took away all protection for New Zealand actors and offshore productions coming on shore. Mm. And they said, OK, we'll open the door and that any, any production that's bringing in an offshore actor gets what they call as a, as a green light or just an, an open book policy and they come without any question whatsoever. We don't have to ask the question and they can come here for a maximum for 14 days or whatever and there's no question. And if a producer says that I want to bring in all my cast from offshore and they're manifestly important to the production, that's it. No so questions. So no, no, no questions local, no local, they don't, no have local. To, don't have to audition right. anybody, and they don't have to. They don't have to uh, prov provide proof that they have, and they don't. And they don't even. No longer even are allowed to be questioned about that. Now, Equity's position was that we used to, when offshore productions came in, without destabilising anybody, would come in and say, "Have you looked at Australia uh, and New Zealand actors for this? Have you auditioned somebody and so forth?" And if they hadn't, then we would say, "Why not?" Right. Uh, but and at the end of the day, I think uh, they ratified of a hundred productions that came in. They looked at all of them and stopped, I think, two actors, I think, right. from, in the entire time that ever occurred. Right. So they were not exactly punitive, they were no. not exactly getting in the way, but that was what the, the racial relations, or the, mm. the, not the relations, the employment relations thing suddenly came, became about with Warner Brothers, yeah. and that all got thrown out the door. So, and now we've got what we call the SPIF, which is a Screen Production Incentive Fund, which is available to basically anybody that applies for it. I mean, if we really wanted to make an incentive, as you asked the question mm. that's been going round and round about, no, 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 then right. what we would say is that, OK, you can't have the SPIF uh, incentive grant unless you're employing New Zealand actors. If you're employing offshore actors, don't get it. Simple yeah. as that. Yeah. Yeah. That's one way we could, we could ensure that we look after our own people. Jill, employers uh, will be happy that a high rotating workforce and 6.8% official unemployment rate keeps wages low, mm. but what is the impact for everyone else in society? Well, it's quite a dangerous precedent, actually. Um, with the neoliberal you know, um, politics, it's led to a flexible labour force that, that's growing. I would be surprised if it was as low as 19%, sure. because you've got mm. to take into account temporary workers, mm. labour hire workers, casuals, part-timers, mm. um, our migrant workforce. Yes. Uh, I'll give you an example of um, a, a security company where all the people doing cash processing, they're counting the cash, um, all but one in that, in that company are, are migrant workers, mm. Indian or Chinese. 
they, they were contracted to work as low as 10 hours a week, some of them 20, some of them 30. Only two out of the whole staff have 40 hour contracts. Their wow. rosters have the start time but not the finish time. <laughs> so they never know from one night to the next how many hours they're going to actually work. So that's an example of, of um, this, what's called the precariat mm. by um, a guy called Guy Standing who's coined this term. The other thing that we're facing is franchisees. So instead of um, having contracted workers cleaning schools, for example, schools take on a mum and dad operation. Sure. And for example, we had a member who was working for LSG actually, he had a perfectly good job on the daytime and he paid $40,000 for one of these franchisees mm -hmm. with his wife. And the idea was that they would clean um, office buildings at night. Anyway, um, he, LSG wanted him to work at night shift, which they have under their flexible labour market, the ability to make him do. So he had to leave because he couldn't afford to give up that $40,000 investment. So out there, and you talked about the tradespeople before, many mm. of them, of course, are so-called self-employed, but naturally having to hire their labour out as contracted labour. And, um, and then we have the situation of people who used to work for telecom who got self-employed yes. as chorus people <laughs> had to buy their trucks and run their businesses. That's right, that's right, that's right. So if you take into account all of those, a I'd be surprised... A chorus of disapproval, in fact. Yeah. 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 If you will, if you will. You'd be, I'd be surprised if it was as low as 19%. Yeah. Now, amongst all these people, you've got a tendency to low pay, low job security, no prospect of mobil mobility, you know, sure. getting progression or anything like that. A lot of people actually come into the workforce as casuals or part-timers hoping to get full-time mm. jobs, but then get frustrated that they can't. Mm. So one um, aspect is, is anger or yes. seething resentment. Mm. Yeah. The other thing that I see amongst um, particularly our cleaners is something that's called anomie, which means a passivity, you know, flatness. Mm. And... Um, and that sort of comes out of despair and defeat. And that lack of stability has a real impact on people's quality of life. Well, the other thing is the anxiety that mm. goes with the stress of not knowing sure. how you're going to pay the bills. If yeah. you have a job that you've got a roster which only has start times, you don't know how many hours of work you're going to get, and you're also on a low pay, then you've got that constant stress. Well, that manifests in all sorts of health outcomes like um, diabetes, yep. heart problems, as well as societal problems like you know marriage breakdowns mm. and family um, dysfunction. But the other thing that um, they've noticed, well, we've noticed in New Zealand to a big extent, is that people become disengaged from the political and social life. Mm. So that you have an increase in the enrolled non-voters. Is right. that surprising? They That's have right. no stake in the future of the country. Yeah. Yeah. You know, most of what people talk about relates to full-time work, and yeah. they have not got yeah. that. They've got no stability. Peter, you mentioned before acting as a profession, uh, as a high level of unemployment. Yeah. How, how do actors actually deal with that instability? How, how, how do you deal with it as an actor? Well, you, you take on as many jobs as you can. You basically become a whore. Right. Yeah, and you, you'll do anything for money. Right. I mean, it's, 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 it's literally as simple as that. And also, I mean, an awful lot of young actors who come out of drama school who don't have a, a wealth of experience or, or background to work on have to create work for themselves. Mm. And that means that to put on a play, they have to, they have to or, or any work like that, they have to put on something. It takes money. So they usually take a loan or whatever. Mm. Then they've got to try and do publicity. They've got to try and write it, publicise it, act in it, perform it, rehearse it, light it, do everything else, put bums on seats, ticket it, market it, sell it, and then try and get people to come along and see it. Mm. And that breeds uh, a certain amount of uh, some resilience, some should say, and mm -hmm. it certainly breeds a certain amount of fear. But the, and, and they have to make their own work, and that's the, the way they survive. But mm. many of them don't last in the industry for very long. Sure. Now, we've got a, a, a wealth of really talented people in this country who cannot afford to stay here, and they leave, and they go elsewhere. And one of the ways that they can afford to do that is to, is to be involved in offshore productions coming on shore and getting mm. experience. I mean, I've got a list of actors who've worked in offshore productions and went on to become major stars. There's 30 of them. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I can read them out, but everyone will know their names. And they're, and they're people that I know and I've worked with who've got work offshore or in offshore productions as a result of, of, of those rules being in place and allowing them to audition, getting the gig and then moving on and yep. establishing themselves as international stars. Now, that's... a 
a way forward. We're a little country. We yep. can't earn a lot of money and all that yep. sort of thing. But there is a way through if you can stick it out. Mm. But these kids end up with debt. They end up with all sorts of problems. They And it's extraordinarily difficult to stay alive and to stay focused and to stay match fit. Sure. If we don't have that regulation, if we don't have that protection, uh, and we don't have foster an environment for actors to be able to do their craft, we lose the ability to tell our own stories from our own cultural perspective, don't we? I think probably we do. Um, we, we lose the ability to tell them in anything other than a sort of a cottage industry way, mm. uh, which for a while has a certain amount of charm. Mm. Mm. But after that, it, it needs to be fairly important. I mean, the thing about uh, um, Peter doing The Hobbit or the, um, the Lord of the Rings is that that's a, that's a, a big story well mm. told in this mm. country, mm. but it's funded offshore. Yeah. Yeah. And this time around, of course, they're using six New Zealand actors who, yeah. are, who will, who will sit, you'll see their names. I mean, they're Mark Hadley, Dean and Gorman, Jed Brophy, William Kirch, John Cullen and Peter Hamilton. And you'll see their names in their careers expand exponentially as mm. a result of the, of, the, of the focus from that. And that's what we, we would aim for. I mean, yeah. the, the opportunity for New Zealand actors to spread their talents and to be, and to be given a, a broader stage to operate on. It is difficult, as you say. Jill, a living wage is one way, one way uh, around the low wages people earn. But how does that work with part-time and underemployed people? Well, this is the big question. Mm. Actually, in the 1930s or the early part of that century, people envisaged that with growing technology, we would be working fewer That's right, hours. that's right, that's right, that's right. Um, John Maynard Keane thought yep. that by this stage, we'd be work probably working about 15 hours mm. a week. And that's what... Um, you know, the hope was that we'd be able to spend some time not only in paid work, but also in creative work. Right. You know, um, I like to knit. Mm, mm. And so that there would be time to do that. But of course, all that takes money. So, you know, the, the issue is that we do really need to deal with this, with looking at time. Mm. And rather than have everybody um, being asked to you know, people who are on benefits being asked to go into the workforce and be competing with other people for the few jobs that are available. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wouldn't it be better to try and find ways that people could use their time for society in a more productive way? Build so, the social infrastructure. That's right. Yeah. So the suggestion is, is that everybody is paid a basic, universal basic income. Yeah. Is this a, this precariat Yes. Thing? Right. Mm, yeah. 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 Although it has come from other sources as well, the idea. I run a mile from that, of course. <laughs> basic <laughs> the, the, the basic, everyone gets a fixed wage. But oh. no, but then you also have the ability to earn on top of that. Yeah. And then you get oh, taxed it, heavily yeah. for what you earn on top of that. Oh, I don't Gareth agree with that. Morgan, <laughs> <that's> <laughs> Gareth, <laughs> Gareth Morgan's uh, done quite a bit of work in isn't it? Uh, moving on, thank you, panel, to issue three tonight. Uh, 600 job losses last week doesn't bode well for the unemployment rate. Uh, we can afford corporate welfare. Why not job creation support? Uh, Peter, during the manufacturing crisis at The Hobbit, our government bent over backwards to rewrite employment law for foreign <laughs> corporates. Should government be focused on helping out corporations or protecting domestic labour laws? I think, I think you really have to look at your domestic market before you look at, at, at the, um, the commercial applications. You have to look after the people in this country who are here, uh, who have vested in it and have paid their dues and are here mm, and mm, are reasonable. Mm. You really do need to look after them. You need to respect them and care for them and to say, look, we welcome you being here. The thing about if, you, if everything is for the corporation, then anyone can come and go and, and, and it makes people feel, uh, A, unrespected, but also un, unwanted, really. Mm. And that's a horrible situation for anyone to be mm. in. And I think any caring, sensitive uh, civilian-based government mm. or citizen-based government needs yeah. to look after its people first and its businesses as a second and find out how they... It's, it needs a focus of people to, to, to channel. I understand that it needs to look after businesses because they are institutions that create wealth sure. and help to, uh, help to spread that around, amortise that through the people, mm. I suppose. But uh, with, without, without the people, without happy people, without people who are focused and, and cared for, they're not going to be prepared to, to bolster those sure. industries. It's really sure. self. It's, it's it comes down to self-respect and regard again. Yeah. I think uh, my my take originally is look after the people first, and the building and the building will come second. Jill, why is it that we have a billion dollars to spend on consultants to arrange cost cutting, but we don't have that billion to actually pay for the costs that need to be cut? Well, ironically, a lot of the people that are doing that cost cutting have been brought back in as contractors that's from people and public servants yeah, who have yeah, lost yeah. their jobs. Yeah. But that's right. No, I, I, I agree with what you're saying about 
we need to think about people first. Mm. I mean, you mentioned before about the number of people going over to Australia, and if you ask any of our members what's their biggest concern, it is about the whānau, you know, their own children who are going to find jobs overseas. Yeah. And the, the loss of, of skills that we, that, we ha that we have in New Zealand as a result of this. So we need to get our economy back on track, but we need to do it in a way that's not damaging to the environment. So yeah. there are a lot of people questioning unending growth as the answer to this. In well, order. Question to both of you, when it comes to corporate welfare, we can't write checks fast enough. When it comes to domestic welfare, we can't find ways to throw solo mums off benefits if it's fast enough. Does the government have a double standard when it comes to welfare? I, I, I answered this question in a way before because I basically believe that the government has big building blocks mm. and it only looks at, at uh, style of government and it says I am for business and therefore everything is it fits in that or it doesn't fit in and it's, and it's squashed away. Yeah. If you happen to get in the way and say, oh look, um, I have, I have um, a family living on the bread line, they're in a particular environment and, uh, and this corporation needs help, they're going to give it to the corporation because I, I think at the core of it they believe a corporation is the greatest good for the greatest yeah, number. Right, I don't right. know that that's true, of course. Right. I think and the, the amount of uh, support that is shown and the amount of, how's the term, bend overedness that the government <laughs> is prepared to do yes. for, uh, for these corporations, especially coming in from offshore, uh, smacks of um, whoring. Do we have a double standard here? Does the government oh, have a carry absolutely. double standard? Absolutely. I mean, you look at what Paula Bennett's doing with yep. these women who um, are on the DPB, saying, dictating to them that they have to send their children to early childhood mm. care mm. and education, for example. Now, if you live out where I live, out in Tuckin and in Papa um, Manure, where there are no early childhood, well, mm. nowhere near the provision mm. that's needed for all the people. But it, it's, it's so controlling. And I think it's just to satisfy the middle class, really. Thank you very much. We'll wrap the show with a final word. Peter, your final word this week is? Oh, yeah. Look, you'll hate this. Please. Uh, I came up with something that I thought would be interesting. Everyone's being held accountable for um, money and so forth. You've got a hand in rules and there's all this sort of background. But the only people who aren't held accountable are the big financial institutions. Mm. So I've proposed a flat tax rate of 20% across the board for the entire nation. Mm -hmm. And any time money changes hands... Mm. Between financial institutions, they have to pay tax, 1% of the... Financial of that, of, transaction tax? Yeah, and I would, yes. call, I would call it a mom tax. And yes. it's, it's a movement of monies tax. Yep. And any time that... The, and, and I think what that 1% what that would do is feed straight into your social and mm. corporate wealth and look after all the people that need looking after. And that way, those businesses that contribute and achieve nothing and deliver nothing except the movement of money basically have a, a, a function, a social function, to look after the, the people of the country who can't look after themselves. Sing it, brother. I love it. Jill, your <laughs> final word this well, week is... Well, last Friday, there was a group of people led by Jackie Brown mm. who went down to the Britomart and they did a get-on-board action. It was a flash mob. Yep, right. And what they were trying to get was 26 weeks paid parental leave which I fully support because it encourages bonding, it helps with breastfeeding establishment. Mm. In fact, in many countries, it's a, it's a whole year mm. that people get to get off to a good start. The problem that I see with paid parental leave that needs to be addressed, though, is that people who are on precarious work, who are casuals or temps, don't have eligibility for it. Yes, that's so right. So it needs right, to be right. expanded to be a universal um, benefit for people. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Jill. That's it for the show. Check out our Facebook site for ongoing union campaigns and actions and follow me on my Citizen Bomber Twitter account for all the latest show updates. Thanks for watching RTRI. Join us again 8pm next Monday for the Union Report here on Triangle TV, the home of original public broadcasting. Good night, New Zealand.